Washington's arid Yakima Basin is the most intensely irrigated area in the country. There's already more users than there is water. Everybody wants water in, in the desert, which is where we're at. 500,000 sun-baked acres depend on rain and snow to fill mountain reservoirs flow from the Yakima River and its tributaries and funnel into an intricate system of irrigation canals. This water grows the produce to fill bins at grocery stores, nourishes hops for beer and grapes for wine, and of course, for Washington's famous apples shipped around the world. Agriculture in this irrigated oasis is a three plus billion dollar industry an industry slashed by one third in one drought year. With no snow and record heat in 2015, water for irrigation had to be rationed for some farmers. This is very low, this is about a third the normal of water. For others, shut off completely. Trees and vine crops, uh, such as grapes and, and hops, they need water every year to stay alive. One year without water and you, you know, you're starting over from zero. The system is stressed. It's not just stressed for farmers, it's stressed for fish. Because we don't have all that snowpack and that ice, a lot of rivers are running really low. Got one, there she goes. Endangered salmon and steelhead struggled to return to spawn, and the fear drought is no longer a once a decade dilemma, but the impending new norm. Climate predictions tell us it's either gonna be warmer and wetter or warmer and drier, but in either case, warmer means less snow. That winter snow is it makes up for more of the water supply than these reservoirs do. And without that winter snow, then we have a water shortage. It's critical that we have additional water supply. This is not something that we can conserve our way out of. If there's no action, if there's no significant action done to improve conditions, the future's pretty bleak. You know, there's a lot of farmers out there deciding what they want to let die. If we had another reservoir or more water, you know, they might not have to do that. The Yakima Basin Integrated Water Resource Management Plan aims to provide that. It's a three-phase, 30-year proposal getting national accolades for the diverse, unlikely group that collaborated and compromised to create it. State and federal agencies, city and counties, farmers and irrigators, Chinook. the Yakima Nation, and conservationists. In the past, it's always been, no, we won't deal with the, the tribes, or no, we won't deal with the environmentalists. They had been fighting each other, all the interests were so long, nobody was getting what they wanted. They were able to stop anybody else from getting what they wanted, but they couldn't get what they wanted either. We can't get there without each other, and I, and I think that that was a big message for, for all of us. For their support, each interest group gets a project in return. New protected lands for environmentalists and the tribe belong with fish passage on dams and habitat restoration, which in turn benefits the recreational economy. We want to see lots of cool, clean water in the river. For farmers, a new dam and reservoir in this sagebrush covered canyon, better water access, and bigger lakes. My understanding is that with the proposed dam, the uh, level of the lake when it's full will rise about 66 feet, which I think is about the height of these trees that we're looking at. Putting in a higher dam doesn't make more water. We can't create water. Despite a broad coalition of support, there are pockets of people. There's an England spruce. Concerned for the history that could be lost if all the projects move forward. When they put a new dam in, this is gone. Yeah, it makes me sad. It's not morally acceptable for me to destroy things to get more water until we use the water we have well. That's not right. What they're arguing is that a lot of other people, like the state of Washington and the federal government, owe them uh, pretty much, well, very inexpensive water, just as, as one of sort of a right of, of doing business. And of course, what hasn't been mentioned yet. I love that they did a coalition, but they were kind of spending other people's money. And the price for all of this, four to six billion dollars. 
I think people ought to pay attention to this because this is money if we're going to spend it on dams in eastern Washington or are we going to spend it on schools. If you're going to put your resources anywhere, you're wise to put it into this because there's a chance that 100 years from now or 200 years from now, there may not be the opportunity to grow crops anywhere except the Pacific Northwest. Harvest begins at daybreak at Frank Lyle's Cherry Orchard in Prosser. These van cherries at their gorgeous June peak. Most of the cherries on this branch here and on this tree have pretty good size and uh, they have a nice sheen. They're very firm. The delicate clusters picked by hand, placed in bins and stacked for pickup. Each one of these lugs is, is about 30 pounds. We'll put it in cold storage tonight, and then sometime either this weekend or in the next week, it will travel over to uh, a farmer's market that we participate in over in Puget Sound. It's a significant and very profitable market for us. What we're hoping to get out of a box of cherries like this is um, between $1.25 and uh, $1.50 per pound back to us. You get paid to produce large, dark, sweet cherries. The larger black cherries, are uh, that's a, a function of, of the amount of water. Lyle's Orchard and Vineyards are thirsty. They're planted in the Rosa Irrigation District, one of the first to lose its share of the Yakima River during droughts. It's pretty desperate here. I'm looking at getting uh, a third to uh, maybe a bit more of the usual amount of water that I would uh, put on, on these, uh, these trees here. We rotate through. Generally, we don't irrigate the whole 80 acres at, at once. We'll irrigate a, a certain portion of it, but every day. What I'm going to do now is check the volts and averages that my pumps are putting out. That'll tell me how much water I have going up the hill. Make sure that it's where it's supposed to be and start making deliveries. This one is running about 72 amps. Ryan Hazard is a ditch tender with the Rosa Irrigation District. I have to keep the grates clean on the front of the plant, and if it gets plugged with weeds, Obviously, the water can't go through there. Hazard's job is to get the thousands of gallons of water flowing in this canal delivered to farmers in the Yakima Valley. We'll go to the low head weir and make sure that it's running the level that it should. And then I start running it out and just making sure there's no deliveries that are plugged or blocked or, you know, if I have any changes to make, I make them. So this is a pipe section. This is pipe just a little ways and then it goes to open ditch. We'll go down the way and I'll show you the open ditch part of it. This resource is so coveted, it's stored under lock and key. There's people that do stuff on the laterals. I've seen everything from people filing the blades down to get more water. I've seen people bend the gates. People that are left unlocked will open them and take whatever they want. So we try to keep everything locked up the best we can so nobody can mess with anybody else's water. And that's their allotment. Not a gallon more. With Washington under a drought emergency. On this particular delivery, he's getting a little bit over a foot. One cubic foot per second. Hazard is only allowed to deliver about one third the flow junior water rights holders usually rely on. I got to parcel it out. I can only irrigate a few hours in the day rather than 24 seven, which normally in this kind of heat and this time of the year, I would be uh, constantly going back and forth over my orchard and vineyard here. I've had everything from, well, we're going to sue the Rosa to, uh, you know, they want to know if I'm getting paid hazardous pay or I've had people flat get in my face. But, you know, it's like I tell them, I said, hey, if I could have made it snow, I'd make it snow. I can't give you something that's not there. It's tough to see them struggle, you know, and I feel for them. 
even though I don't farm myself, I, you know, I feel for them because this is their livelihood. I have a relative of mine that's on my beat and uh, he raises cattle and hey, you know, that's quite a bit of his income every year. Well, he had to sell half his cows this year because he knew he wasn't going to get the water. Rosa has a 1905 water right that's held by the United States government. What that means is the, the, those who are senior to us, we go to zero before they get cut to 99%. This is the wheel here. Detroiter shows up, unlocks the uh, gate, makes the adjustment. Scott Ravel runs the Rosa District. Whether we like it or not, we are where we are in line. Starting from the Rosa Dam on the Yakima River, its 95-mile-long canal supplies water to 1,700 customers from Sela to Benton City. The district completely shut down the canal for three weeks during prime growing season to ration its limited supply and did some water wheeling and dealing. A gentleman across the way sold his water to Bob Sharon, which is one of the bigger hop farmers, helped Bob out, paid his water bill for the year. And, you know, he grows hay, and luckily for him, this year was the year that he was going to rotate and replant again. The Yakima Basin includes Kittitas, Yakima, and parts of Benton and Klickitat counties. In a normal year, there's about 3.3 million acre feet of water runoff. Five reservoirs store about 1 million of that, only half the water needed for water rights entitlements. Proposed projects in the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan would try to fill that gap. The plan includes three water supply projects uh, over the next 30 years, the first of which is getting at some of the water in Lake Kachis uh, that is currently below the outlet. Most of the water will remain in Lake Kachis, but during a drought year such as this, where we're below 70% supply, we would be able to access that water to get us up to 70% supply. We don't get full supply, but we get enough that we think we can scrape through the bad years. In addition to the new outlet at Lake Cachis, the first phase also includes a five-mile pipeline linking it with Cachalis Reservoir, and Cleellum Lake would be raised three feet. Later on, the dam at Bumping Lake could be replaced by a bigger one, and water from the Yakima River diverted to fill the new Weimar Reservoir. Together, that adds enough water equal to filling another, even bigger, Cleellum Lake. It would be huge to be able to give farmers what they want, you know, when they want it, yeah. Another reservoir would obviously help us. We're relying on the snowpack as another reservoir. Well, when we don't have that, you know, obviously, yeah, that throws up a flag. Hey, we need another reservoir. The plan is not all about adding more. It also encourages using less through improved conservation efforts. Things as simple as more efficient sprinklers. We irrigate this orchard with uh, these under tree sprinklers. There's a limit there as to how much, much you can do. Lyle says it still comes back to the volume of water he gets and when it's delivered. If I could have had a, more water earlier, I could have mitigated the sunburn and the sun scald. The more reservoir storage you have, the more you can carry water from year to year. So if you have a dry year one year, you can hopefully have some water you carried over from the year before. That additional water storage, not only to sustain farming, but support another focus of the integrated plan. Chinook. At Priest Rapids Dam in Mattawa. Chinook. Brian Salskin and his workers with the Yakima Nation Fisheries are after a specific type of salmon. Sockeye. 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 This is part of our reintroduction program. We're reintroducing adult sockeye back into the Yakima Basin. On the other side of this wall is the fish ladder. Out there, there's a series of gates that we close on the ladder. We close those gates. The fish can't swim up the ladder any longer, so they have to swim in, swim into the adult trap. We open this gate, and this is the gate to the Daniil. And we start up the water pump up on the Daniil. Uh, water flows down to the Daniel, uh, cre creating a attraction flow, and the fish have no, no other alternative. If they want to move up, they have to swim up the Daniel. Once they get to the top of the Daniel, they have no other course but to drop down into the flume. Chinook! Everything else that we're, we're not collecting, we send it back out to the ladder. Sockeye. The sockeye slide down to holding tanks. Some tested for DNA. We kind of find out which, which ones are actually succeeding, getting out, spawning, getting out, and returning as adults. Those not randomly selected, loaded into a tanker truck. Each truck can hold around 200 fish, and then we transport them. This giant traveling aquarium takes the sockeye on a journey they can't swim on their own. A trip that once took their ancestors weeks, just two hours from the Columbia River to Cleellum Lake.
We put them in a lake and the first thing they want to do is, is go back to something that's familiar to them. They can't do that once they're in the lake because of the dam. So they're basically stuck in here and if they want to survive, they're going to have to go up and spawn and what they do in September and October. And so then their, their offspring will be wild in this system and they're the ones that'll want to come back here and they're the ones that have came back. Salskin is honored to be part of this one-of-a-kind reintroduction. This is a species that's been missing from our waters for over 100 years. And it's something that's not only missing physically, but also spiritually. The fish, they, they, they represent who we are. They kind of give us identity. Sockeye, Spring Chinook, and Coho once thrived in the Yakima Basin, using rivers to migrate to and from the ocean, nourishing the Yakima tribe along the way. We traded with tribes from the, over on the west side all the way out to the plains, down to um, northern California, all the way up to southeast Alaska. And trade was, we were well known for, for, for trade. Our livelihood and our way of life has always been tied to the land, to the water, and to what the water provides. But those same waters also appealing to early Yakima Valley settlers, lured by fertile land and the promise of irrigation from Bureau of Reclamation dams like this one, constructed in 1933. We knew back then we didn't have enough water for all the, all the activity and all the farming that we were, we, we had planned. And so when the Bureau came in and built this reservoir, it was prior to the Endangered Species Act. It was prior to a lot of environmental regulations. And so the, really the focus was on, on just irrigation water. The problem with this dam and every, and every major dam in the Acma Basin is they were built in the early part of the 20th century without any fishway. And so they uh, virtually overnight ex uh, eliminated all the fish runs in the, in the headwaters of the Yakima. Jeff Tayer recently retired from Washington's Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's a labor of love. But won't quit working just yet. Forty years ago, or almost 40 years ago, when I started working in this basin, we were really trying to hang on to any salmon in the Acma Basin. Come gather round me and I'll sing you a song. His first day on the job? I'll tell you a story of people that were strong as an enforcement officer caught in a riot during the fish wars of the 1970s when Native Americans battled for their fishing rights. Today, there's the flume. Tayer works alongside the Yakima Nation on projects like this temporary passage to get the new sockeye out of the lake. As soon as the water drops down, it dewaters it and it doesn't function. In an irrigation reservoir, the water level comes up in the winter and spring and really and goes down when irrigators are using the water. So you have to build a fishway that will accommodate that rising and falling effort. So what we're looking at here is a scale model of the helical fish passage facility. A first of its kind fish passage design and the first major capital project of the integrated plan. It took Bureau of Reclamation engineers years to test and vet just the perfect shape that protects the fish on their fast journey. So there's gonna be a large structure out there, you know, 700 feet long going down the bank that would allow for fish to be able to escape the reservoir at different elevations. So as the reservoir is filling, fish will be able to continue to go out and it skims the fish right off the surface, off the top 10 feet. Basically takes up the head difference between the reservoir here and the river down there um, which can be over 100 feet, takes up that energy so that the fish um, are able to travel safely downstream of the dam. Fish passage here at Cleelum Dam was authorized by Congress in 1994. Hasn't happened. It's just about to happen now. And it's, ha it's, it's, it's happening now because of the integrated plan. We still got a ways to go. Phil Rigdon says the Yakima Nation is relentless in its fight to restore salmon, citing treaty rights and its water right, the oldest in the Yakima Basin. We've had decades of saying we want fish passage here. We've gone to court. We already saw the, you know, the loss of Sockeye, the loss of Summer Chinook, the loss of Coho and, and these things. And the tribe said the states and feds aren't going to do this. We have, we have won the bolt decision. We we're sitting here, we, we finally got the right to half the fish, but what, what good is a right if there's no fish? There's the fish facility. The tribe took on an active role of building its own fisheries, like this one at the Rosa Dam. We'll gather all the fish that, that are migrating up to the river. They get dropped back into the river, and the ones that we take for our supplementation facility, 
um, we'll, we'll transport them up to, to the hatchery. Or if they're sockeye, we'll transfer those all the way up to Lake Clown and put those in the river. But without fish passage, Rigdon says this alone would never be enough. So for their part of the integrated plan, the tribe negotiated fish passage at Cleelum and at several other key dams. That's the great thing about the integrated plan is it's, it's not just about building reservoirs. It's about looking at the avenues to enhance and, and what are those, those major blocks in the fisheries. Some of that will be more water, some of that's going to be um, habitat work on some of the main stretches on the Yakima. We had to come together to be able to do something like this. As sockeye spawn once again in cool headwaters above Cleelum Lake, Salskin says hopes rest on their offspring. They need a lake system to survive and basically they're the only species of salmon. Once they're, they're fry hatch out of the eggs, they swim straight to the lake and they utilize the lake as a nursery. After a year, the smolts travel downstream to the ocean, mature for two years, and hopefully return to spawn. They'll still need assistance getting back over the dam, but a new collection system at the base will make it a much shorter trip. We want to see the, the Yakima Basin flourish again with once carried, you know, nearly a million salmon at, at one point. We're, we're excited when we get over 25,000 salmon returning. And we're hoping to see the hundreds of thousands. Everything will be raised, and the and the new fishway will be out there. And that new fish passage. The scale of restoration is one of those once in a career kind of things. The one last project Tayer wants to see through. If we have a hundred thousand sockeye in Lake Cleom, the fishery here that's going to develop, the the sport fishery, is going to be spectacular. Imagine the folks from the metropolitan area of Seattle coming to the sunny side of the hill, this beautiful scenery, beautiful lake, and catching salmon here. Do you want to fish this cliff side here? See that little slow spot on the right side? Most of the guides hit that up. You did? You son of a gun. Oh, get us into this slow spot and I'll drop the anchor. The upper Yakima River. <laughs> oh, would you look at that? Already attracts anglers. Got him. That guy's big. Yeah, he is a little hogger. Oh, and the hook just spit right out. Would you look at that? That's a nice looking fish. Holy crap. There you go. And he's heading home. Ready to keep uh, cruising down. These are Washington's only blue ribbon trout waters, navigated by top notch guides like Cam Johnson. Nope. And Noe Perez from Red's Fly Shop. Trying to get a little closer. Fly fishers are drawn to the gorgeous canyon scenery and, of course, to the fish. Got one. There she goes. Hiding in the sweet spots along the shore. You get the big boy, I get mini me. Just a little whippersnapper. The hook's off. It's just caught in the net. Awesome. See those rocks there, no? Blame for that. The river temperatures stay cooler here over anywhere in the whole Northwest because we have three reservoirs that are nice and deep, nice and cold. So the Yakima River is the one river that you can fish all year round, drought or no drought. Nice shot there, Mike. Steve Joyce is a co-owner at Reds. Another men there, good. The dominant fish that we catch fly fishing is rainbow there. trout. We also ah. see a handful of cutthroat trout in here. We also see some white fish down in here. There he is, that's a better fish. And we typically see some uh, pike minnow, which used to be called squawfish, now they're called pike minnow as well. That should be the lane right there. The Yakima River today as a trout fishery is a much better river than it was even just five years ago. We're seeing more fish in here and we're also seeing bigger fish. You got one? Oh yeah. Nice! Don't let him get in there! Good man. Oh, he's a nice one. Good man, good man, good man. All right. There's your rainbow. This river has been catch and release only since 1993. Nice, quick, easy release. 
More fish passage on dams and the Yakima Nation's work to restore salmon could have a transformative effect on the recreational industry banking on this resource. Salmon are worth a billion dollars to the state sport fishing industry. These 214 miles, like a highway for fish, their route out to the Columbia and back up to spawning grounds. The more salmon and steelhead that return, oh, yeah. Come on, baby. the more anglers who want the challenge of nabbing one. He's a big one. Those are the people that come in and they fill the hotels. They stop at the gas station and get gas. They go to the restaurants and have dinner. That tourist population coming through here, and it's almost become a cultural shift in Seattle that on the weekend or as a general rule, you're gonna either go east and spend the weekend over here in the sunshine or you're looking for a, a recreational residence of some kind over here. If mine's bigger than yours, you're buying beer. The city doesn't have to go in and, and you know develop more houses and, and run more water lines and, and all that kind of stuff. So it is a great piece of business that's super important to the local community. Oh yes. Hey, I beat you. The additional water storage irrigators want also directly benefits the fishery. I am happy with that. During the latest drought, just as cold water species migrated back, water temperatures spiked. Once you get up to 65 degrees, the uh, fish are at risk of killing over, especially when you're bringing them up out of the water, which is why we like to keep them in. Good cast. That should be in the lane here. Only 10% of sockeye made it this far back in 2015. And Joyce says the deeper the reservoirs, the cooler this water might stay. The fish and the wildlife that inhabit these rivers, they're very resilient. And as long as we give them a chance, it'll be interesting to see what they can do. You can't quite see it out there, but that's the North Fork of the Tianaway. Conservationists say this trickle in the shadow of Mount Stewart provides added protection salmon and steelhead need. This is where they spawn, this is where the eggs hatch, where the juveniles have their first part of their lives before they head out the system. These headwater systems are the, the most important and the most endangered part of the system. The Tianaway River in the Kittitas Valley is the only undammed major tributary in the upper Yakima Basin and is now protected. The trees that you see over on this side uh, and up on this side over to that first ridge are the Tianaway community forest. The state paid $100 million in 2013 to buy these 50,000 acres from a private landowner. What's it like for you to stand here and see that and know that this is now owned by the state? <laughs> Uh, it brings tears to my eyes. Uh, it's just a, an incredible accomplishment. Dreams of many people uh, came together to make this possible. We were able to acquire a piece of land that uh, is very special in the hearts of many folks and wouldn't have happened but for the integrated plan. Back here, you can see some of the farmland at the lower end of the valley. The Peter Tianaway Dykstra River is an environmental is right attorney in and fought for the preservation of this land slated for houses. We've discovered through science that groundwater is connected to the surface water of the Tianaway. And if we had uh, not protected it, those homes would have dropped straws into the groundwater and sucked more of the important flows out of the river that's used for farming and fish here uh, and really uh, damaged a lot of good work that we've done to restore fisheries and also keep farming going in the lower valley. The forest is now collaboratively managed by state agencies with input from the community. It's one of the most incredible places in the state in my view. Jay Manning says the arrangement not only protects habitat but allows people to enjoy it. It's already happening. It's been a, uh, a great hiking and mountain climbing center. Uh, it's becoming a mountain bike mecca, and it has huge potential there. I now have two grandkids, and I was thinking about how this valley is going to be available to them, almost the whole thing, for their whole lives, and, and I just, I'm really proud about that. The fact that we're standing here talking about this today, did you ever think that would happen? No, no, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I've been working in the Yakima for over 30 years, and part of that time is a an attorney representing the Department of Ecology on water issues and uh, the Yakima for most of that 30 years was the water war central we called it. It went um, cases out of the Yakima went to the, U the state Supreme Court probably literally 10 times in that in that time period. 
Nobody could agree on anything. Those water rights lawsuits started in 1977. Two years later, Congress authorized the Yakima River Basin Water Enhancement Project to find a way to manage the overallocated water supply. But farmers argued against leaving water to restore fish habitat. Environmentalists and the tribe opposed taking it with new dams and reservoirs. And that conflict really led to nothing. Nothing good happened. We were able to sort of stop each other. A turning point finally came in 2008 when a new reservoir on the Columbia River, Black Rock, was deemed too expensive. People kind of finally realized, you know, kind of what we're doing to ourselves, you know, just for whatever reason, you know, for whatever agendas people might have. Um, we couldn't go on living like this, you know, with killing everything around us, you know, and then expecting to s survive and thrive. The Yakima Nation, we, we joined with the Rose Irrigation District and we, we signed a letter that said, let's go into this different way and we want an integrated approach that will look at um, storage, but we'll also focus on fish passage. And we had never gotten along before. We, you know, we objected against everything that the other one did in the Aquavella Court and the other places. And for us to come and say we want to join together to solve the problems in the basin was a big step. When we started this, it was a big steep hill and, and kind of scratching your head at the bottom of the hill thinking how are we going to get over that hill, you know, so. Derek Sanderson is Washington's agriculture director and served as ecology's lead on this at the time. We had a situation where the stars aligned um, and that by that I mean the right people in the right place, the right temperament that that, that recognized that this was the time it, we, to, uh, to take action. There's been decades worth of studies on how to potentially fix problems. Um, but um, what we needed was um, the collective leadership to say it's time to stop studying, it's time to start putting um, uh, projects on the ground that will solve the problems that, uh, that had plagued the, had plagued the basin for, for uh, many, many years. For a year and a half, Ecology and Reclamation led the diverse group that worked to develop the mutually acceptable integrated plan. There's some degree of enlightened self-interest because we all know that we either sink, you know, we swim together or sink together and that's... Sanderson uh, says with limited state and federal funds, a unified front there. was their best shot. Everyone would get something of what they wanted. No one would get everything. But, you know, that's that's the nature of a collaborative effort. Are people surprised when they hear an environmentalist supporting a plan that includes possibly two new dams? Absolutely. Um, and, I, you know, just as uh, people are surprised to hear that the irrigation community is supporting efforts to leave water in stream for fish, just as people are surprised that a local conservative community uh, and county that had almost 70 percent public ownership add another 50,000 acres of public ownership as part of the plan. So there's surprising uh, reactions from people from all of the constituencies that are part of the plan and that's what's so special and unique about it. The integrated plan became state law in 2013, securing $170 million in state money so far, with a promise of up to 50% of the total costs. Good morning, the committee will come to order. We're now the team is lobbying in D.C., pushing for the complementary federal legislation and money. It's, uh, it's not very often that we have a whole panel that in, is in unison uh, about a bill that we have in front of us which begs the question, who opposes this? And uh, it, it's not possible that we could be sitting here just having a discussion about fish and water and not have some, uh, some opposition out there. It's mostly the water storage projects that are controversial within the plan. It's mostly NIMBY, not in my backyard. They don't want uh, uh, the reservoir shores going down and showing bare ground in front of their cabins or their homes and things like that. It's really hard to hear that when we hear that the only opposition is a handful of disgruntled cabin owners and I guess I would be one of those. Susie Sear and her neighbors on Bumping Lake have much more to lose than views. Unlike Lake Cachise, where a new outlet will allow irrigators to draw down the water in drought years, spoiling summer views and maybe property values, families on Bumping Lake wouldn't have a view at all. Where these 16 homes sit, completely flooded by a bigger lake, including the Sear Cabin. I absolutely fell head over heels in love with this place first visit. It was at the time the cabin was very run down, kind of falling apart, musty and old smelling, and I didn't care. It was wonderful. It's more like a museum now. I guess the walls are imbued with a lot of history and a lot of stories told 
around the table. That table, the benches, the signs. This was the Forest Service sign for the original Bumping Lake Resort. Really nothing has been touched. The living room was built for, um, for plenty of people to gather. And much of it remains original, lovingly restored to its 1930s glory. This place is pretty amazing. <laughs> they, yeah, it's, I shouldn't even say thanks because I have nothing, we didn't build it, we're only taking care of it. And preserving it and keeping it here for other people to enjoy. This cabin was built by Jack and Kitty Nelson and Jack was the original dam tender and they ran a little resort here with cabins up on the hillside. Uh, that they rented out to all sorts of folks and a lot of people from Yakima. People come by here regularly and knock on our door and say, oh, is this the old Bumping Lake Resort? Because I used to stay here as a kid. The cabin is on Forest Service land. The Sear family bought the building in the 70s and worked to get it listed on the National Registry of Historic Places, hoping to pass it to their children. They feel like they're part of this place. They feel as much as the trees and the, and the plants, they feel rooted here. When they come back to visit, and they're all over the world right now, the first place they want to come back is here. It's surrounded by these wonderful forests. Uh, it's hard not to love the place. Miles McPhee doesn't own a cabin, but has just as much of a connection. Our first family camping trip, when I was uh, probably in about the fifth grade, was up just across here on the shore of Bumping. We used to come up here and fish and water ski. And it's always been a, a really wonderful place. In fact, my father, when he was in high school, came up here and skated on this lake and went over to uh, the Nelsons, who was the dam keeper, and they served them hot chocolate. I've always heard that story. Today, he shares the trips with his wife, Sandy. We like to kayak up here and swimming. And at a quick 40 miles from Yakima, so do 18,000 other adventurers each year. Oftentimes, if you want a weekend uh, camping site, you need to reserve by February. If the dam and lake are expanded as planned during a later phase of the integrated plan, these campsites will be gone. The Forest Service has said it is doubtful that they can relocate this campground because of the steep hills and the lake will go right up to those steep mountain sides. My understanding is that with the proposed dam, the uh, level of the lake when it's full will rise about 66 feet, which I think is about the height of these trees that we're looking at. Flooding the campground, marina, homes and trails. This blue line marks the uh, the limits of the new reservoir. But up here is where uh, the really spectacular old growth uh, grove is. And you know, these are really amazing old trees and that will all be inundated. We'll see up ahead, there's Engelman spruce coming up. Tucked in this forest around Bumping Lake. Look at this layers of trees, it just keeps going. And some are three to 500 years old. The value of a tree like this intact in the forest is the impact that it has on the surrounding forest and the area, it provides shade, for the whole area, which cools the streams and creates habitat or sustains the habitat with the cold waters that the fish need. When they put a new dam in, this is gone. Yeah, it makes me sad. To me, it's not even personal. I care because I come up here and visit, but to me, it's the bigger picture of losing this to the world and to the to everybody. The integrated plans environmental review admits the loss of the old growth forest would be difficult, even impossible to offset. There's so few areas left like this that if we keep chipping away and take a small part of it here and a small soon we have none and to have none to me is not acceptable. You can't keep taking away what net can't be replaced. There's an Engelman's first. Sierra is deep into research yes. on Bumping Lake for her book and found replacing and moving the dam downstream isn't a novel idea. Five times there's, we've looked at this and five times it has not gone forward. The dam didn't get raised because it doesn't work. Putting in a higher dam doesn't make more water. We can't create water. It was built this size because this is the size that the watershed could provide for. This is the right size of dam for the right place it fills every year. If we build a higher dam, it won't fill. Sears says several studies done over 50 years show it would take at least three years for the lake to fill to the new height. One of the many reasons it didn't happen was the siding of the dam itself is on an area where, the where there isn't bedrock to tie into. And so they do core drilling and the core drilling was done as far back as 1965. And there isn't suitable soils to tie into. You can't build a safe dam. And so again and again, they've abandoned because of fatal flaws with the plan. Plan hasn't changed, the geology hasn't changed, the habitat destruction 
we're talking about hasn't changed and yet we're looking at it again and we're wasting more taxpayer money and time fighting this. It's not a good idea. It doesn't pan out economically. The integrated plan uh, overall says that their cost rate, their benefit cost ratio is positive, but that's based entirely almost, well, like 80 to 90 percent on the benefit of restoring an anadromous fish run to the Yakima Basin. If you actually just look at the economics of this one dam in isolation, which the Water Research Center at Washington State University did, the benefit to cost ratio is about 0.18, which means it returns about 18 cents for every dollar spent. So it makes no sense from that standpoint. While environmental groups involved in developing the integrated plan support the Bumping Lake expansion, the Sierra Club does not. Critics feel homeowners and taxpayers were excluded from the planning process and feel Bumping Lake was part of a deal a trade for the Tianaway in order to convince conservationists to agree on the rest of the plan. This was not a trade for Bumping Link. It was selected because as opposed to a whole new dam and a whole new reservoir, um, raising an existing dam has less impact than a brand new one. Past uh, uh, iterations of bumping are, were much, much larger. We've, this is a very scaled down um, increase in volume. It's, and it was done as we looked at the impacts associated with inundation. We tried to pull back the footprint um, to a point where we thought the impacts would be manageable. Sanderson says the expansion is not a for sure project. Years of more environmental review, feasibility studies and permitting are ahead. But he stands by it, saying Bumping Lake is the key to a more reliable water supply and added capacity. The runoff to storage ratio right now is about six to one, so there's excess runoff in the basin that's not captured in this re relatively small reservoir. It's about a 33,000 acre foot reservoir. Bumping Lake is on the Natchez Arm, a tributary of the Yakima, and could allow for more flexibility in releasing flows. Storage is a, a necessary part of this plan because we need enough water for, for summers like this when we have a drought. And well, we're not talking about just water for out of stream uses and irrigation, but also water for in stream, for for the fish so that we could have the, the flows that are necessary to have the salmon get out of the basement as well as the cool enough water for them to get back and that's where the cooler water is at. This year we didn't have a big snow runoff event where the river you know went into when we get all the snow melt in the spring this river can go to three or four times the size that it is right now and that's critical to happen in the springtime for the salmon and steelhead because those big pulses of water that come down the river or would actually flush the salmon smolt out to the ocean. So as long as we have the capacity to do that, then we can do that artificially even if we need to in a drought year like this. It's kind of like we're the low hanging fruit. There aren't very many people that are affected. There's very few property owners here. So this is an easy grab. It's unclear where the cabins would be relocated and if the Forest Service will pay. We've gotten really mixed messages about that. Selfishly, we thought, well, if they ever raise the dam, Maybe we'd have waterfront property, though we'd just move up a little ways, and that's not an option. We have been told that there won't be recreational properties on, this on the new lake shore, never again. And to tell you the truth, as much as I feel for this cabin, and I'm, I, I, I love it as much as my own family, um, I feel more for the bigger area. There's a legacy to be passed on, not just in the buildings here, but in the forest here. And I feel really strongly about passing that on to my kids and their kids and um, keeping this area as it has been forever. It's worth it. Yeah, it's a great place. I love this place. You know, I understand if I owned a cabin on Bumping Lake and it was going to be inundated by a, by a new dam, I probably would be quite unhappy about that. That's a significant thing, but when I weigh that against the future of salmon runs and agricultural economy in, in uh, the Yakima Basin, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile trade-off. The manager of the Rosa Irrigation District uh, testified to the Secretary of Interior in 1967 that he was willing to give up his own cabin at Bumping Lake 
uh, for the greater good to expand Bumping Lake. And, and that version of the expansion is a couple times bigger than what's proposed today. But statements like that upset McPhee most, given the history he says is around junior water rights. I grew up in the Yakima Valley on an apple orchard, and we had a senior water right, which was nice. About the time that I was in grade school, they opened up the lower valley with the Rosa project, but the understanding then was that uh, in drought years, that water would be cut off, and implicit in that is that they wouldn't plant really high value uh, crops like apples and grapes that were really susceptible to drought. You, you know, if, if you've got a cornfield, you can follow it for a year. So the greater good argument is not really very convincing. It, what they're arguing is that a lot of other people, like the state of Washington and the federal government, owe them uh, pretty much, well, very inexpensive water just as, as one of sort of a right of, of doing business. And I don't necessarily agree with that. If they said, yeah, we'll build it and we won't ask you the taxpayers for it, I'd be like, oh, go ahead. Uh, but they're not doing that. Democratic Representative Hans Dunshi. I just think it's too large to succeed. Is Olympia's most vocal opponent of the four to six billion dollar integrated plan. I really worry about the tax, the Washington state taxpayers and I worry People are expecting water out of this, and I worry that that'll never happen. As the House budget writer and former chair of the House Capital Budget Committee, it's his job to deal with finding the money for it. We're going into this, we're spending money on uh, studies, EISs, feasibilities, so we're plunking down millions right now, and we have no financing plan other than a, a hope and a wish. You wouldn't buy a house that way. You would know where you're where your uh, income was coming from. You would have an estimate of your monthly payment. We have none of that on this. This is all just the, gee, why don't we buy something kind of cool? When all these individual interests, the environmental community, the Yakima Nation, the irrigators would go to the legislature and ask, we need funding for something they wanted. And they would, the legislature would typically say, you know, there's just too much disagreement in the valley about this, this being a good investment. You guys need to go get your act together and get together and come up with a single plan. And then, then, we, can, then we can talk about funding. And we did that. We brought the plan back and the reaction at first was, well, who told you to go develop a plan like this? Because it, it is expensive. I love that they did a coalition, but they were kind of spending other people's money. I believe it's a, a a good plan. I'm not sure it's going to provide all the water that's needed, but uh, I'd rather have some water than no water at all. Republican Senator Jim Honeyford, who chairs the Senate Capital Budget Committee, points out that the cost is distributed over 30 years and split three ways. The legislation says uh, the state can be no more than 50 percent. And so you've got to find other 50 percent in uh, local dollars, uh, payments by the farmers, federal uh, payments. The New Deal, which came in and built massive things, um, I don't think Congress is going to do that again. If there is any risk, plan supporters say it's not to Washington taxpayers, but irrigators who are paying for the most expensive elements like the new dams. They're willing to, to step up and take, take ownership and responsibility, and that's, that's a departure, that's a different paradigm than, the, than past water projects, uh, particularly federal projects, where the federal government came and paid for everything up front and then um, the, the users of the water would pay back um, over time. And, and now we're talking about the, um, the irrigators actually arranging for the financing, the design, construction uh, with their own resources up front. They haven't done anything yet. And they have no financing plan of how many acres, uh, you know, how many acres and what's gonna be the cost per acre. I haven't seen those numbers at all. I wanna have an apple, but I wanna have the real price of the apple of the water in the apple when I buy that, not in my tax bill over here. A federal evaluation shows crops already don't pay for the water they get. Of the $149 million irrigators agreed to contribute to the original Yakima project a century ago and all the dams that divert water for them, they've paid less than 10%. You can only afford to pay so much. And Lyle says farmers aren't sure they can absorb more. Frankly, right now, we're kind of looking at a long-term contraction in most commodity prices. Lyle's cautious to convey too strong an opinion on the integrated plan, given his role as the head of the Yakima County Farm Bureau. Farmers always look here on irrigated land, they always look at, at more storage as better. But uh, I do realize that uh, the devil is in the details and uh, not everyone is going to agree on, on the best way forward.
allocation of water is still a highly contentious issue. And he can't entirely dismiss the cost concerns. I think those arguments, the cost to, to uh, the taxpayers, the fact that government only has limited resources and, and uh, needs to allocate those in efficient fashion is uh, legitimate issues that, that have to uh, be look, looked into. We have to make the argument and say this is going to be profitable for not just us but every but everybody in the state the realities of the latest drought he says we've been hurt could do that convincing we had to throw away much more cherries than we normally would but what really concerns me is going into next year because that uh, that's when I'll, I'll see a significant crop loss next year if you're going to have half the amount of water, what might be the difference that you'd see in the chair? You know, that's a very good question. And what you will see is uh, you will see smaller cherries, more like this, as opposed to a larger cherry like that. Washington's Department of Agriculture estimates half of all crops in the Rosa were destroyed. More than $1 billion worth, four times higher than anywhere else in the state. A scenario that's played out for junior water rights holders 14 times since 1970. In uh, 91 or 92, the, the drought there, I, I took a tour of the valley and you could see uh, orchards that were allowed to dry up because they wanted to put the water on other crops that were more profitable. And that uh, would be an awful tough decision to see your investment in trees and that go down. But, Senator Honeyford, who was a farmer himself, says growers in his district installed ponds, even changed crops to get through lean water years. So how is that? Is electric? I mean, you got electric pumps, yes. Now they're helping pay for this. We're north of Sunnyside, and this is a re-regulation reservoir, which will allow better management of water in the Rosa irrigation system. Instead of unused irrigation flowing back into the river, Ravel explains to Honeyford that water will be pumped here and held until it's needed further down the canal. It's three days from the top of the system where water's diverted in to get down to the bottom. And so with water stored here, pumped out of the canal and then released when need be, you have less uh, operation water getting spilled and more efficient and so it's going to be better for agriculture. While not directly part of the integrated plan, it ties into it. Now, so I've got an electronic gate. And conservationists say more water saving efforts like it are included that provide enough water savings to fill Lake Catulus at the top of Snoqualmie Pass. But that's not enough and that's not going to be enough uh, water for farming uh, and for fish in the future. Water conservation can do some to help stream flows, but if we really want to bring the numbers of salmon back to the Yakima Basin that we historically had and live up to our commitments to the Yakima Nation, we need to do more and we need to have some stored water in order to make that happen. We do have to rebuild the fish population. We have a moral and legal obligation, I believe. Uh, when we Europeans came, we took the land from the Indians and now we're kind of wiping out their fish too. So there are things we need to do and we should have water over there, but again, there is, there water, is water there. Are we using it efficiently? That's the first thing we have to do is, um, are we conserving? Scientists continue to argue whether a changing climate will mean more droughts for the Yakima Basin. But models and trends show warmer winters with less snow. That has critics questioning whether investing another four to five billion dollars is the right move in what is essentially a desert. What's worked for the past hundred years might not work for the next hundred years, especially with with perhaps climate change and, and changing what rainfall patterns. It might not work. We have to do things differently. And building our way out of it by building more dams is not the solution. It won't work. The impacts from climate are going to be extreme enough over a long period of time that it's gonna force us to rethink a lot of things. For us to continue having this level of irrigated agriculture in this location, those questions will be asked for sure here. For us, you know, taking food production land out of production when we have a growing population, right now it doesn't make economic sense, right now it doesn't make sense from a food supply standpoint. Now right into the riff of water, good shot. Call it good climate change, call it global warming, call it whatever you want to call it. I would say that we're very fortunate to live in the Pacific Northwest because there's no doubt about it, we have one of the most reliable water sources of anywhere in the country and really almost anywhere in the world when it comes down to it. And when you consider all the farmers, 
workers, haulers, processors, ports, and retailers that rely on this region. Plan supporters say if action isn't taken, our state's entire economy could take a hit well into the billions of dollars. The system is stressed. It's not just stressed for farmers, it's stressed for fish. It'll be stressed for communities, uh, that the cities and the, and the towns, and their ability to grow and to, uh, to provide an economic base for their population is, is uh, severely constrained by the, the lack of water supply. If the water weren't here for that, what would these people be doing? Where would the uh, food crops come from? Most of the growers in this in this district are second and third generation. They grow a variety of, of conventional and organic crops. They're not corporate interests. They're, you know, real true family farms. They employ a lot of people in the basin. My parents uh, planted this orchard here in North Prosser almost 50 years ago. There's been some difficult periods, but overall it's, uh, it's been very good to my family. This is a, a tremendous place to farm. Lyle doesn't know yet how much damage the 2015 drought did to his orchards. But you can see how these things grow. This is just this year's growth. But suspects his trees will hurt in subsequent years. They won't be as lush, they won't have the leaf area, and they'll tend to produce smaller fruit of lower quality. There's also the constant worry, this wasn't the worst of it. It makes you wonder, well, how are these farmers, you know, if something like this happened back to back, how would we make it through it? If you had a, a resource where the water was there all the time, you know, yeah, it would it'd be a game changer big time for all these guys. Relief remains decades out. For the plan on paper to become reality, it still needs federal authorization and funding. It's nice for me to see these sides that have traditionally not agreed, agree to something and then work together, that in itself is a value, that's good behavior that ought to be uh, rewarded in my opinion. Manning and the others are confident that support will come through and say starting in 2025 with the first phase. Okay. Then in 2040 when all three phases are complete, the region will finally have a stable water supply for people and for fish. You know there's a great kindred spirit that goes into what we're trying to achieve. It's a time that we either really put a focus onto the challenges we see, if it's climate change, if it's the dams, if how things are run, if we're going to have salmon here and if we're going to have these things, and that $5 million is not that much when you compare to the values of what you leave behind for the next generation. The greater good involves generations and you know having something that will uh, ameliorate some water shortages once in a while. There's a big trade-off to that, and I think we need to recognize it. I think it increases, you know, one's general life, you know, to have these salmon swimming in your backyard, swimming up streams and stuff, the quality of life, and, you know, to have those kind of waters that they can live and survive in and spawn in. You need clean, pristine water, and you got to be able to not only help that quality of water, but preserve it, you know, preserve what we have and make things better, you know, for future generations. And that's what we're kind of doing, you know, we're trying to work together to, to accomplish that.